Good evening. Right now, Metro police are desperately searching for the person or people responsible for killing a man and a woman. Breaking news now. A triple shooting leaves two dead. Never expect for somebody to tell you your loved one was, was murdered. This Labor Day will mark 42 years that have haunted the St. Cloud family. 30 years. 30 years this family has waited for answers. A couple months go by, three, four, five, six, and you, you really start to struggle with the idea that the case might not get solved and uh, that somebody might get away with murder. It's very unfortunate that we have any cold cases at all, and it's certainly unfortunate that we have as many as we do. And that's why the Ryan's work and the work of Project Cold Case is so important. Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, I'm Ryan Backman, the founder and executive director of Project Cold Case, uh, coming to you with my uh, COVID hair don't care. Uh, gonna see how long this uh, this uh, haircut can last before my wife has enough and uh, and takes the scissors to me in my sleep. But I appreciate you joining me uh, tonight. Um, it's gonna be <coughs> kind of a, a probably a much faster um, uh, Facebook Live today. Um, I've got a couple things I've got to take care of. We've got some some uh, victim issues going on that uh, are. are requiring our attention and we didn't want to just leave people high and dry, but, um, uh, we definitely wanted to, um, to touch base with everybody and then get back to, uh, to what our real role is, which is, uh, um, uh, advocating for families of, of unsolved homicides. Um, do you follow us? You watch us, you know, that that's our job, but sometimes people don't really understand what that, um, what that job actually entails. And, um, and so, uh, recently, you know, we've had some families that we have been working with and helping that, um, recognized just how important our services are, um, because, um, they had a need, uh, and specifically a need during this time where, uh, where, um, services aren't as readily available. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, if you do have questions, I see a lot of people are, are a lot of our families, a lot of our friends are watching, uh, Tammy and Derek and Latresa, uh, Miss Jones and Sissy and all of you guys appreciate you tuning in and, and chiming in and letting us know, uh, Lakin, uh, you know, appreciate your, your time, uh, appreciate your attention to obviously, um, this important cause, uh, that's, that's dear to me and to, and to our staff, uh, Frida and Clint, who are always working uh, behind the scenes, even if they're not on camera. Um, although I tell you this, I think uh, that may change here pretty soon because I'm, I'm struggling to come up uh, and, and always be available on, uh, on the Facebook Live. So you may get a, a little peek of uh, Frida and Clint here very soon. Hey, Chad, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Janet, um, yeah, Tammy, thanks for uh, the reminder. Uh, Thursday evening at six o'clock Eastern time, we are hosting a virtual support meeting for families of unsolved homicide victims. Um, uh, oh, hey, Heather. Yeah, sorry. We were just, uh, going by your Facebook name there. Um, anyway, uh, wanted to, um, uh, to remind everybody that, uh, Thursday night, 6 PM, we're having a virtual support meeting. Uh, through our uh, our Zoom app. Uh, if you are interested in uh, participating in that, uh, all we ask is that you be a survivor of an unsolved uh, homicide. Uh, if you haven't submitted your loved one's case to us, please do that in the next couple of days. Uh, and then you will want to send an email to Frida or call our office, but you can email Frida at uh, FridaWP at uh, projectcoldcase.com and Frida will make sure that you get the link to our Zoom meeting um, either Wednesday or Thursday uh, and, and um, you know, to make sure that you got time. I know that uh, Zoom has done some upgrades uh, for security purposes. And so you may have to, if you already have a Zoom account, you may have to upgrade it or update it. Uh, before you can sign into anything. Uh, so you may want to take a few minutes to to do that, um, you know, between uh, 
between now and Thursday, I realize it's already Tuesday, but between now and uh, Thursday evening and, uh, and see if that, um, if that will help uh, kind of speed things along. And that way, when you log in, um, you know, we will be doing, um, um, you know, we'll be doing our support meeting. You, as always, is with our normal support meetings that are in person. Um, you, you, this is just virtual because of the times we're living in and craziness, uh, trying to do our part to make sure no one else gets infected. Um, but, um, and Clint just posted the link in the comments. So if you, if you missed what I was saying about the support meeting, you can click that link for more information. Uh, but, um, you can participate as much or as little as you want. Uh, you can turn your camera on, you can turn your camera off. We will mute everybody. Um, uh, as they come in and um, and then we'll kind of kind of figure out the best way, depending on how many people, uh, how to interact. Um, we're working on next month's uh, support meeting, June support meeting to be facilitated by a uh, by a licensed mental health professional that is going to um, work on um, some relaxation techniques and some breathing exercises, some stuff to help us with uh, anxiety and depression, particularly during this time. So if you have information or if you have topics like that, like specific things that you're dealing with uh, during COVID and uh, your, the loss of your you know, loved one, uh, send those emails to, to our office as well. Send those to Frida so we can start compiling those for, for next month's support meeting. Um, uh, but, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where we stand. So yeah, Tammy, um, I, I don't know if register is the right word. Um, you have to, but when we'll send you a link and when you click that link, it will, that's an invite to our, our zoom meeting. Um, now you, you have to have the zoom app on your computer. Um, so I think when you, when you log in and you sign into, to zoom, um, that's your registration. You don't have to necessarily register again when you when you join our meeting. Um, it will just uh, it'll just automatically bring you in, but it'll have your name under you, and um, you know, and we can go um, kind of uh, de again depending on how many people we have. Uh, we've had people for a long time want to participate in a in a support meeting that didn't live local, and we've been trying to figure out the best way to do that. Um, if there's something uh, positive about, you know, COVID-19, uh, I guess it would be that, that it kind of forced our hand and we are, um, you know, we're, we're now having to do our staff meetings with Zoom. And so we've kind of gotten comfortable with it. So we're going to, uh, we're going to just use that uh, opportunity to, um, to extend our support meeting to anybody, no matter where they are, that wants to join us. Like I said, we do, we control who gets that email. Uh, so who gets the invite and that with the link and kind of our, and, and that criteria is we want survivors, you know, that are going to benefit from this. We don't want, um, you know, no offense to our media friends, but we don't, we're not inviting them to this. Uh, you know, we certainly don't want somebody that's just nosy um, chiming in. So we would like to have um, your, you know, if you haven't submitted your case net not yet, and I'll tell you how to do that in a second, um, make sure that you do submit a case so that we have some kind of record of you and we have your email and contact information so we can uh, we can send that link to you. Again, if you send Frida an email and we don't have any idea who you are, uh, we'll send you that that case submission link so that hopefully you can get that completed in time, and um, and and then we can you know um, have you included uh, in in the meeting. So um, uh, I and I want to talk about that a little bit um, uh, because we have we have been doing really well. I'm really happy with these uh, Facebook lives uh, that we've been doing since uh, COVID-19 hit and, uh, Hey Sherry. And, uh, um, and I, I really, really want people to, um, to know, uh, that we are available to them still. And, and so, um, we've, we've been pushing these Facebooks at a later time when more people have, ac have access to their, uh, to their Facebook page and can join us as opposed to our normal, you know, we used to do them at noon on Tuesdays and it was really hard for people 
that worked to be able to listen and watch. Um, so we are, um, you know, we're, we've tested out this, you know, later on in the day and it certainly appears to be working well. Uh, so we're going to, going to continue with that. Um, we may have to shuffle days. We're still, we're still playing with that, but, um, but we'll continue them in the evening. Uh, but what we've noticed is we've had a lot of people interact with us and, and, uh, ask questions, which is what we want, but not all these people have submitted their loved ones, uh, case and information, uh, to our website. So, um, you know, we're, that's how we help, uh, you know, is, is to be able to, um, to not only provide you with this information, uh, but also share your loved one's picture and their story. So, um, hey, Margie, thanks for joining us. Jackie, uh, Monica, Kathy. Wow, lots of people. Brittany, lots of people uh, chiming in. Um, so Clint will, will post the link to our case submission page in the comments in just a few minutes. Um, and, uh, and, and if you haven't done that, if you have a loved one that has not been uh, submitted to our site, I encourage you to do that, uh, you know, um, so that we can start helping and start serving you and start uh, assisting you and have your contact information, be able to reach out to you, be able to invite you to the virtual support meetings. Um, as we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, and, and, you know, and by the way, you can go back and watch the old lives um, there. You know, they stay on our Facebook page and then um, we, we um, back them up also on YouTube usually. So, uh, so you can find them there, but, but we've talked a little bit about some specific topics, um, including the services that we provide um, and, and how we can, we can assist with your loved one's family. Um, so like Brandon just said, we have featured uh, a grandparent story. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, that's what we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to provide you with advocacy and support. If you're struggling, uh, if you're grieving, if you're, you know, have questions that, that you need answered that we can help with. But uh, beyond that, we want to be raising awareness for your loved one's case. Uh, you know, Frida and I had a conversation with a a family member today and we said you know advocacy this is what we do we we work with you one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a safe place in a confidential environment where you can share your concerns and your fears um, and not be judged uh, hey francine and um and you can also you know be um you know in a non-judgmental environment uh and then we'll raise awareness kind of on top of all of that, you know, we, we, we provide that awareness because we can, um, but our real job is to, is to provide you and your families with, with advocacy. So that's, that's our main goal. So uh, Clint uh, posted the, um, the uh, case submission link on, um, on our site. And, uh, um, <laughs> and uh, we are, um, uh, encourage anybody that hasn't yet to click that link, submit your loved one's information, submit your information and to um, make sure you get us a picture. You don't you don't have to have a picture at the time of submission, but it certainly, certainly helps um, us to have it the sooner, the better, because we'll turn around and um, as quickly as we can get that information and get the uh, the case submitted, we will. Um, We'll post your loved one's picture on our on our Facebook page right out of the gate with a little summary about what's been going, uh, you know, what the status and situation uh, as our first attempt at, at raising awareness. And then you, there will be uh, other attempts as, as we go. So, um, you know, get that information into us as quick as you can. Uh, there has been when when COVID-19 first hit, we we saw a little lull in uh, in submissions and uh, we weren't sure why. I'm still not sure why. Maybe people were just, you know, focused uh, elsewhere. But since then, since people have, have been learning to live uh, with this uh, pandemic, um, those submissions are starting to increase. And um, and so uh, our staff is, is constantly working hard to get that if all the information that we need and then get it. Uh, onto our site, um, projectcoldcase.org, and of course, onto our social media platforms as well. Um, Ms. Jones just asked uh, if the JSO detectives have come back to the to the office yet. 
Um, I don't know if they are back in office, uh, Ms. Jones. I do know that they're working. Um, we've had a number of calls with um, the detectives uh, recently and heard uh, families calling us and telling us that they have been uh, contacted by the detectives here locally. Um, but I also know that some people I know have not gone back uh, yet. So um, I, I think that, um, that June 1st is, is kind of a little bit of a target date of when they're going to, um, you know, try to start bringing people back. But I don't want you to let that discourage you from calling and leaving a message or sending an email because I know that they have access to those things, whether they're working in the office or not. Um, so uh, it's it's good to um, you know to keep in mind that those these detectives are struggling themselves right now uh, with uh, how to you know continue these investigations uh, in the midst of of COVID nineteen, um, but. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't have access to, to their emails and can't respond to you and, and tell you themselves uh, what their current situation is. So um, so hopefully that helps. And that's not just local. That's that's everywhere for everybody that, um, you know, now may actually be a good time to call the detectives. It's funny. We, we At first we thought, you know, that the cold case investigations were going to come to a screeching halt. Um, by, because the detectives are, were not able to, um, uh, you know, to, to do certain types of work. And Rebecca just, you know, chimed in and said the detective on her son's case uh, told her last week that they were still working from home, but they are uh, returning calls and answering emails. Exactly. So, um, so we, um, you know, that's, that's been our, our experience as well, but, um, but so we thought they were going to come to a screeching halt and they did in the sense that, um, you know, law enforcement has not been able to travel uh, because they're a, a government agency and most states uh, suspended government, you know, travel, which means they couldn't have put in a request uh, to fly, you know, to to, um, you know, to California to interview a suspect. Um, they couldn't put in a request for a hotel and that kind of thing. Um, so, so in that sense, it did uh, kind of stymie the investigations. But now what we're seeing over the last couple of weeks is that uh, it appears that a lot of those things that were sitting on the detective's desk that were every time we would ask, they would be like, oh, yeah, it's on my desk. Uh, I'm trying to get to it. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. I just need to follow up on a couple of little things. It appears that a lot of them are. Uh, have been following up and, and reviewing those things and, and getting to them because we have gotten word from a number of, of uh, families and detectives that have kind of indicated that they are um, they're working uh, and they're and they're making progress on things that they hadn't hadn't really looked at um, uh, as you know quickly as we had hoped. Um, so so there is there is that going uh, right now as well. The the hope that. Um, that while they have this downtime, that they can review some files, um, look up some things, do some, you know, research uh, and an investigation until they are, um, you know, free to, to travel and to interview and, and stuff like that. So, um, uh, so again, um, questions, comments, um, you know, I'd love to, to, to answer and help you out along the way. Um, I really wanted to kind of make sure that that everybody, uh, you know, recognizes the the importance of submitting that case so that we can help raise awareness and so that we can invite um, you to support meetings and, and stuff like that. So um, so I hope that, that people will will um, complete that link uh, um, sooner rather than later. Um, know that you'll hear from us um there there are uh criteria you know without getting into too much because we've talked about it uh previously but um a case does need to be um over a um uh, over a year old um and the case does need to be uh, a homicide uh if it has not been determined a homicide uh we just, we aren't investigators, so we can't, you know, we can't do anything with a case that hasn't been determined a homicide. 
Um, we do have a couple of of places we can refer you to try to get you know second opinion um, services uh, and second set of eyes to look at things. Um, but as far as what Project Cold Case does, um, you know, unsolved homicides, missing persons with foul play suspected. So if if you have a missing person and you uh, suspect that they're being held against their will, their their will somewhere. Um, that that's not a, a case that would fit our criteria. If you have a missing person that you believe um, maybe is struggling with some addiction issues or some mental health issues and is across the country, um, but they are alive, um, you just want to know how well, you know, know that they're doing okay. That's not something that, that we would uh, be able to help with. Um, but if you have a missing person who, you know, um, all indications are that uh, foul play, uh, is the reason why they're missing, then, then we can, um, we can add them to our site and, uh, any, any murder case that has been, uh, hasn't been resolved, any, uh, hit and run case that hasn't been resolved. Um, those things are, are, uh, are where our little niche is that we, that we focus on. So, um, so Francine's asking if uh, Detective Devereaux heard anything on her, her son's, if we've heard from him about uh, her son's case. And we have not heard from uh, that detective on anything. So uh, if he was going to reach out to us or we were hopeful he would, he has not. Um, but um, I wouldn't say that to surprise right now with everything going on. Um, but, um, but we'll have to follow up on that and see, uh, see, you know, and see what's going on with the case, Francine. So, um, thanks for, for bringing that up. Um, with that being said, you know, um, uh, the big, the big things right now are, um, are, uh, you know, the support meeting on Thursday evening and, and getting in those, those submissions, um, Kathy said, I hope to hear something about my son's, uh, case. Uh, thanks for everything y'all do. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, this, this time is, is really a great time for information gathering. Um, you know, I got a, I got a weird text today from a, uh, from a reporter, a local reporter that, uh, was looking for some information on a cold case. So I take that as a good sign that, that the media is getting back into um, the routine of, of uh, talking about something besides COVID-19. So uh, might be a good time to reach out to, to your local media and, and ask for assistance if, um, um, you know, if, if you, it's around a birthday or anniversary, you know, that's kind of a little uh, extra incentive for the media to, to take on a case and, and share the story. Um, so you might, might consider that, um, uh, Ms. Jones. Yeah, I have, yes, Ms. Jones definitely have your daughter, uh, touch base with them and, and see what's going on because like Rebecca said, and like we said, like we are seeing them, uh, respond and interact. Uh, the only real issues we have seen um, with cold case investigations right now is the inability to uh, physically interview people, witnesses, suspects, um, and uh, travel to go interview people, you know. Um, so those seem to be the things that are the hurdles right now in cold case investigations. Um, uh, hopefully they won't be hurdles for long, um, you know. Uh, the airlines didn't shut down, but um, but when the when the um, the state and, and when the law enforcement agencies are going to be willing to to reimburse for travel or pay for travel expenses is is kind of a thing we need to be keeping an eye on um, because that that's going to impact some of these investigations. Um, Let's see. For those of you that we've talked a little bit about genetic genealogy uh, in the past, there's a, a new show coming on tonight and um, I can't remember the name of it, um, but it's like the genetic detective or something like that. It's uh, CC Moore, who uh, works for Parabon, um, who has kind of positioned herself at the forefront uh, as the face of, of genealogy. Um, 
you know, and she's kind of been credited with a, a lot of the, uh, the cases uh, that have been resolved using genealogy, uh, genetic genealogy. So um, she has a show and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's on ABC at 10 o'clock Eastern uh, time uh, tonight is the, um, the first, first episode. I think there's like six episodes or something that they're going to show. <clears throat> and, and the first one is tonight. So if that's something that you'd like to, to tune into and watch and see if, um, you know, uh, get a little more information on genetic genealogy, forensic genetic genealogy, and how that may assist in um, in your loved one's case. Uh, you have that opportunity this this evening to to tune in and watch. Um, I don't know anything about the show as far as um, you know whether it's going to be good, whether it's going to be family focused, whether it's uh, you know, going to be encouraging. Um, I really don't know much about it. Um, I've, I've met CC Moore, but we, you know, we're Facebook friends, but, um, but we don't talk regularly or anything. So, um, so I, I don't really know what to expect. Um, you know, and, and I just am passing that information along in case people want to, um, uh, Chuck, uh, my buddy Chuck just chimed in and said um, that the cold case program at the uh, National Institute of Justice used to pay for investigative travel, but the program was discontinued. Uh, we need people to advocate the uh, OJP, the Off Office of Justice Programs, is that right, Chuck, uh, to fund it again. So, uh, Chuck, you you and I need to have a chat about that because, you know, I'll, I'll come talk to anybody. I'll email anybody. Um uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why a case goes cold. Funding should never be one of it. You know, one of those reasons uh, when I get frustrated, when I hear people talk about, you know, uh, an agency that can't afford uh, genealogy, an agency that can't afford to, to travel, an agency that can't afford private lab testing, um, that stuff makes me, you know, want to pull my hair out. Uh you know, and I did not grow this, these COVID locks out to yank out because uh, some some agency uh, says they don't have the funding. Uh, not only um, is there are there options there. Thank you, Rebecca, for posting that link. That is the uh, that is the series that I was talking about. Um, but th not only are there options out there um, for 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 funding. Uh, cold case stuff like that, but um, but any agency should be embarrassed not to be able to um, to fly a detective somewhere to uh, to interview a suspect. And we know it happens. We've had agencies tell us that they have, um, uh, you know, they know who they need to talk to, but their agency doesn't have enough money to send them to you know Wyoming or you know Omaha or wherever it is. Uh, to actually interview the person. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to out that, uh, that detective because he's as frustrated as I am. And I'm not going to out that agency because I think there's better ways to, to go about it. But um, if, you know, but that's the kind of stuff that can't, can't happen. You know, there's got to be a way to, uh, to fund that kind of stuff. And, uh, and Chuck, yeah, yeah. Office uh, of Justice Programs and, uh, and, you know, I, I'll give you a call, shoot you an email in the next couple of days, uh, Chuck, and and see what we can do to help out. Uh, really appreciate all you've done, Chuck, uh, with uh, with your position. Um, I, I know some of you, many of you, have seen us share and and heard us talk about the uh, the NIJ's best practices um, guide uh, for implementing and sustaining a cold case unit. Uh, that the the um, National Institute of Justice put out um, last this last year, um, but uh, it was a ton of really really good information and really really well thought out and and put together and uh, and you know I basically email it to every single detective uh, homicide detective that I I come in contact with. Um, Chuck sent me some hard copies that I you know got rid of really quickly uh, passing out uh, to detectives because, you know, sometimes uh, hearing it yelled and screamed from, you know, a, a victim's perspective or a victim's seat, you know, sometimes falls on deaf ears. 
uh, but but this uh, this book was put together uh, through the, the the National Institute of Justice and with the help of a cold case working group that was made up of some of the uh, most prominent names in, in cold case investigations. Um, you know, so uh, it's it's a um, it's a wealth of information and a, a wonderful resource for anybody that is. Um, uh, you know, involved in a cold case investigation or a cold case unit or team or supervisor. And, um, you know, feel free to uh, to ask the detective in your loved one's case if they have um, uh, if they've seen it and if they have a copy of it. And if not, let me know and I will make sure they get one. And so will Chuck, because he he has already said he can send more. So, uh, you know, we we will make sure that everybody that we know of has a, a copy of that, um, you know, that that uh, cold case uh, um, uh, resource um, for uh, uh, the cold case investigation unit. So um, let's see. Francine said, I heard the individual that murdered my son is locked up at the P farm on another case. And his information was told to my nephew that is locked up with him. Yeah, I mean, that 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 could very well be true. You know, a lot of times uh, investigators, um, that's exactly where they prefer a, a known suspect uh, to be for, for multiple reasons. One, he's not out there in the general public doing anything. And two, uh, he very well may some may say something while incarcerated that um, that is exactly what they need uh, to to. Um, to charge that individual with the crime. So, um, you know, if, if, uh, if a, a bad guy is in uh, jail, we hear a lot of families, a lot of times are frustrated. He's in jail. I know he's in jail. I, you know, what, um, why won't he, you know, why won't they uh, arrest him on these charges or why will they charge him with this other crime? And a lot of times it's because that is the absolute best place for a suspect to be until you are, you know, really confident and in, in the case and, and ready to charge them and move forward. Because once you you charge that individual with a crime, um, speedy trial is invoked, and, and you've got to uh, you've got a very limited amount of time to be ready as the prosecutor to take that case to trial. And um, so you want to have all your ducks in a row and be ready. Now, the defendant is normally going to waive speedy trial because it's typically in, in their best interest to give their defense attorney plenty of time to prepare for the case. But um, but if you're not ready to go as a prosecutor, if you're not ready to move forward with that case and uh, the defendant does not waive speedy trial, then um, then you're going to end up, you know, with an acquittal. Um, or a, a dropped case with prejudice that is going to mean that you can never uh, arrest and charge that that individual again. So, um, so if you if you find out that the suspect is is incarcerated, uh, make sure the detective knows that. Um, and um, and and if they if they don't know that, and if they do know that, then that's they're probably very well aware that he's in there, he or she is in there, and that's that's a good place for them to be in hopes that they. Um, start talking and saying something to their cellmate. Shannon asked if uh, if an agency would be willing to exhume a body for possible DNA evidence if they lost all the evidence collected in the case. Uh, I was already told funds were a reason my mom's case won't get a detective, so they probably wouldn't be. Yeah, we I think we we talked to you, Shannon, a little bit last week about your mom's case and that um, the lost evidence and the um, and and. And I have seen agencies um, exhume bodies, um, but typically what you need is, is it's not, it, it never seems to be just one piece of evidence, you know, so, so they probably are not going to exhume the body if the only thing they're going to find out is that, um, you know, that, that there's some individual's DNA, you know, under the fingernails or something like that. Um, they've got to be able to corroborate that with other evidence, you know, so, um, so if they have a suspect because they have a witness that places them at the scene, um, or something like that, there's going to be a much higher likelihood that they would, um, that they would spend the funds on an exhumation because that's, that's a really, really, really expensive, uh, process. And, um, 
So my guess, and again, just knowing from what I remember from last week and 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 my experience, um, if they if they were to exhume, it would be because they thought that that was going to give them something that tied the case together as that final piece that would um, allow for a, an arrest and prosecution, and probably would would not do it if all it was going to do is provide one piece of evidence um, in a case. Because remember that the defense attorney's jobs are uh, are to come up with all the hundreds of ways that, that their client's DNA could have ended up under your mom's fingernails or on her body or, you know, at the crime scene. And so um, if that's all they have to go on, um, you know, then they're, they're simply going to say, you know, that, um, that it was from a, a, a different incident and, um, and the uh, district attorney or state attorney is going to have to have more than just that to, uh, to prove it. So, um, it's not unheard of though for, for an exhumation, uh, but it's expensive. So that, so they probably want, um, want there to be more, or if they lost everything, all the evidence, uh, in your mom's case, then it's going to be harder to get them to agree to do that. Um, but I still would like to, uh, to have more conversation with you, um, about that, you know, and about your, your mom's case specifically, because, um, it's hard to, to talk in generalities. I, you know, you just commented and said that makes sense. So I'm glad that I'm able to, to provide you, you know, at least like a logical explanation. Um, but of course, without, you know, knowing the specifics, it's really hard to give you a specific, uh, explanation. And, uh, and of course, if it were up to me, there would be enough funding. And if it were up to, to Chuck, uh, I know, um, you know, if, if he could do it, if I could do it, uh, there's a lot of people out there that would provide all the money, you know, we could come up with um, to at least try uh, everything possible. But um, but unfortunately, that's not the, the position we're in. And uh, yeah, they claim to have lost everything. So, um, you know, we, we had a case recently, a family um, where, uh, they were told, you know, everything had been lost. And then, um, and then the detective called and said it had miraculously all been found. Um, so, uh, and then we have other cases where it is known that that evidence wasn't this was lost because it was destroyed. It was known that it was destroyed because it was marked incorrectly or because there was damage to the evidence locker or the evidence building. Um, and the evidence had been compromised, you know, or flood damage, you know, fire damage or, or, or some other means. Um, we do know of cases where evidence has been, you know, discarded because it was compromised because of those types of things. And, um, you know, and then we know of other situations. Hey, darling, uh, we do know of other situations where, um, uh, you know, that information is, hey, Phoebe, is uh, it's lost and it, and it actually is lost. They don't know where it is and it could potentially um, show up. So, uh, you know, it's, you just never know. It's, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to, to, you know, to give anybody an answer because uh, every agency, every big agency we know of has had um, lost or damaged or destroyed evidence. Every agency we've ever talked to has had some kind of natural disaster or, you know, man-made disaster that, um, compromised evidence. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that is, is dealt with particularly in older cases, you know, how was it handled? How was it secured and how was it, um, uh, you know, maintained. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard to know, but, um, but it's, you're not the only one that's ever told us that story. And, and we had a, a situation where a family, uh, the evidence was, was known that the evidence was destroyed because the, um, the case had been labeled as a, um, as an accidental overdose and, um, and it wasn't a, an accidental overdose and they figured it out relatively quickly, like within the first month of the investigation. Uh, but, uh, 
somebody forgot to change the status of the case uh, as it re in regards to the evidence that was um, that was being saved. And at some point, you know, along the way, uh, the, there's a person in charge of making sure there's enough room for all the new evidence coming in. <clears throat> and they do that by getting rid of evidence that is no longer needed. And they found a case that had, you know, of an accidental overdose as it was listed and, um, and destroyed that evidence because it had never actually been changed over to a homicide, despite the fact that they knew it was a homicide. And uh, that evidence was destroyed. And that family uh, never did get justice. The, uh, the, the suspect who was known all along but could not be proved uh, ended up dying uh, last year, maybe the year before, um, of natural causes and, um, and the family, um, uh, did not really take comfort, uh, in that either, um, you know, that he was gone, but, uh, now there certainly is nothing that can be done about that case. So, um, so it happens, it's, it's happened here locally where, uh, you know, um, evidence was mishandled and where uh, evidence was was damaged uh, with a flood and a roof collapse. And um, and so sometimes uh, those are just some of the things that can add to the struggles of investigating uh, a cold case. So, um, you know, but then <laughs> I, I've got a story that, you know, I, I can share that uh, um, was, was one of the most amazing moments uh, in, in, in my world and, and Clint, uh, here in our office was, was with me, uh, when it happened, he can, he can vouch for it. We, um, were working with the Jacksonville Sheriff's office. Um, they were doing a spotlight on, um, five little girls that had all gone missing in a, in a span of three months. And, uh, three of them, the girls were never found their remains were never found there. Uh, they were not recovered. Um, two of them, you know, their remains were found. They were known homicides. Uh, but um, so imagine in a three month span, five little girls go missing. This is in the mid 70s. And um, when was the last time five little girls went missing in, in a three month span and they weren't related? Uh, but these cases were difficult and there was, you know, they were in different parts of the city. They were not, there were some, some very interesting similarities and then some things that were, you know, completely random and, and different. So, um, so it was a, it was very difficult to try to one, figure out if the cases were connected and two, to, to, to resolve them. But um, we were uh, with the, the sheriff's office when they were doing a, an interview with the media about one of the cases and, um, and basically, you know, their response was, uh, well, uh, I'll have to get back to you on this case because we're still looking through the file and, and we haven't really had a chance to search through it uh, enough yet. And so um, so then the, the interview stopped and, and the media went on their way and Clint and I went downstairs and the, uh, the sergeant was showing Clint the, the vault, the sheriff's office and introducing him uh, to the um to the cold case unit and showing him their office. And he was literally explaining to Clint, you know, like well, this, these file giant, you know, file drawers are all the cases from 1970 to 1980. And he, and he opens up a drawer and he goes to grab a file. And he's like, and this is what uh, kind of the size of a file from, you know, 1970 to, and he's trying to pull this file out of the file cabinet and it won't come. So, Instead of there's just so many files jammed in there. So instead of fighting with it, he just closes the door and opens another drawer and grabs a file and pulls it out. And he goes, so this is about the thickness of a case file from back then, you know, and it was a very small case file compared to what they look like now. And at the same time, the sergeant and I both looked at the file he was holding and it was the little girl who we, he had just done an interview about and had told us that they weren't searching for the file. They couldn't find it. It was misplaced. Um, they, they, you know, it was lost, but they had every bit of confidence that it wasn't gone or destroyed, that it was just um, misplaced. And sure enough, somebody had filed that folder in the wrong place. And, um, and, and that was uh, just by chance, by divine intervention, by whatever you want to call it, 
uh, out of thousands of, of cases, uh, the sergeant literally just randomly reached into a drawer and pulled out um, that, that victim's file. Um, and, and it had been lost up to that point. So uh, we were in shock and, um, and, and really just could not believe what we had just witnessed and had really honestly hoped that that, that was a, a, a sign and a divine intervention that, that we were going to get somewhere uh, and they were going to get somewhere on those cases. Um, it had, uh, hadn't gotten to that point, you know, uh, unfortunately yet. Uh, and that was a couple of years ago. So I, I, you know, I don't know that it will, but, um, but it was, I mean, it was so random and so crazy to, to, to reach in there and for him to pull that file out of all the cases he could have, uh, grabbed coincidentally grabbed. So, um, so yeah, crazy stuff does happen. And, um, and, you know, uh, it's why hope, you know, we always talk about hope and maintaining that hope because uh, you just, you know, if something's lost, it can be found. You know, if um, if if technology doesn't exist, when a crime happens, it may exist in the future. And, um, you know, so we want those families to to uh, always maintain hope, but to always also have realistic expectations uh, hope doesn't mean that your case will will always get solved and will get solved quickly, um, but uh, but there there should always be hope that something could break at any time. I mean, that that's a crazy story, uh, but probably the the more wild stories is is somebody just walking into the uh, sheriff's office and just saying, "I'm here to confess." to a murder from, you know, 18 years ago. And that happened uh, last year in, in Jacksonville. And I've had a, a number of uh, detectives come to me and say that they know of situations like that, where somebody that was not uh, a part of the case, wasn't in the case file, wasn't a suspect, um, wasn't on the radar, so to speak, uh, came forward years later and just said, I did it. And, uh, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy, but, but those things happen. Um, and so, um, um, you know, so you, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to have, have some hope that, uh, that, that, uh, something will break in your favor, your way. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, then each of us have our own belief as to, um, whether justice, you know, can be served on this earth or whether true justice comes uh, in another form uh, after we leave this earth. And, you know, most of most of us have to believe that uh, there are consequences for those actions, whether we witness them here or not. And uh, and that can can oftentimes give uh, give comfort. So um, uh, and, and Shannon just said, you know, that that, that her feels like a confession is the only way. And, uh, and Shannon, you're not alone there. That's, that's, uh, what the only thing I believe will ever solve my dad's case, uh, would be a confession. And I'm not going to hold my breath for that. Uh, it obviously happens, but, um, and certainly not, uh, the norm and not the, the common occurrence in these, uh, cold cases. Um, but I also know that, um, that there are other things that could happen, uh, in my dad's case that, um, that, that caused there to be uh, a resolution, you know? So, um, so I, I, I want to believe that and, um, you know, and I want to know that, uh, that, um, it's not going to beat me, you know what I mean? I'm not going to let it, um, let it get the best of me that I will, will be able to maintain that hope. And I will always, uh, believe that, that, that it can happen. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm going to, going to focus my energy, uh, in helping other cases that, that maybe, um, you know, maybe just need a little more publicity, you know, maybe just need somebody, uh, to share it on Facebook, um, to, to reach that person that either is willing to confess or that is willing to come forward and say, I was there and I know what happened and I know who did it. And I'm willing to, to testify now. Um, and, and I wasn't, you know, years ago. So, um, 
you know, and Cheryl saying that about her sister's case as well, that a, um, a confession and, um, you know, uh, I, as much as I wish that weren't true, there are cases um, where that is the only thing that will solve them. And there are cases that won't get solved in our lifetime and, and maybe ever, um, you know, but, uh, but I think you don't give up um, your loved one's memory or the hope that, um, that you might reach somebody that, that can provide some answers or, um, or maybe uh, provide answers in another case. So, um, you know, keep, keep that in mind as well. And, uh, and know that, um, you know, our organization remains here, um, and, and available to you. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And Sheree and, and Suzanne's uh, mother, Nancy Jo Canode. Yeah. Their case, you know, has been, uh, particularly frustrating for them and for us. And, uh, and, but, you know, when I tell you not to give up, when I tell these families not to give up, um, I also, we're not going to give up. And that means that we're going to continue to raise awareness for these cases. Uh, we have situations where cases are, uh, um, the suspect is deceased, um, but there's, he's only a suspect and is not for sure known to be um, the offender. And that case is technically still open, you know what I mean, and can't be cleared. Uh, but somewhere out there, there might be somebody with that information that can uh, provide it. That's the proof that they need to clear the case. And then um, it may not be the answer we want um, and the, um, you know, the appropriate consequences for their actions. Uh, but it's it's answers that, that we didn't have. And I, I think those are important, too. Um, Let's see, who, who just asked if we do other cases? Phoebe asked, do you work on cases in other states? So we, we don't uh, investigate, um, but, but we provide uh, you know, resources for family members and we raise awareness for cases no matter where they are. Um, so if, if you have a loved one that's the victim of an unsolved homicide and it happened in you know, South Dakota, um, you can submit that through our website, projectcoldcase.org. Uh, there's a case submission uh, uh, link, and it's also in these comments. If you go back through the comments from a little bit earlier, we posted that uh, case submission page. And it uh, doesn't matter where you are, or where your loved one was. Um, you know, most of our cases are within the United States, uh, but we actually have some from Germany um, in a couple of places you know, outside of, of the United States. Uh, we would accept a case you know, from anywhere in the world, if we felt like, you know, well, we'd accept it from anywhere in the world, because we feel like um, that by sharing it on our social media platforms, that we could, um, that, that we might reach somebody. And, and that's, that's, you know, what we're trying to do. So, um, you know, um, Eugene Lanza, yeah, yeah. So um, Eugene's uh, niece just, um, um, commented about, um, you know, that's, uh, Eugene's, uh, case was our spotlight this week. So, uh, yesterday, you know, one of the ways that we try to raise awareness for a case is once a week, um, we, we spotlight a case, give it a little more info, get a little more information from the family. We try to, to, um, to share with the public of who this individual was, not just defined by their last moments on earth as a murder victim, um, but but why it's so important that, that the person that killed them be held accountable because this person was loved, because they uh, were a part of their community, because they they were valuable um, and, and everybody has value. And so we want to try to show that. And um, and Eugene's case was the one that we, we spotlighted this week. Uh, we posted it yesterday. Uh, on our Facebook page. It's on our website, on the homepage. If you go to projectcoldcase.org, um, you'll see uh, um, Eugene's picture there with a link to the, to the story and, uh, and whatever images and, uh, and content we could, we could come up with included in that story. So, um, you know, it's, it's great to see you here, uh, Ivy. And um, I know that's the name you go by on, on, on Facebook, but um uh, it's good to see you on here uh, and, and sharing and, and, you know, that's, that's the role. So for Phoebe that was asking other states, 
Um, you know, uh, I think Eugene was a, a Florida um, case, but um, yeah, he was Hollywood, Florida. But like, if you if you go to our website, there's a, a Charlotte, North Carolina case that we spotlighted a couple weeks ago, and um, you know, we um, we we don't discriminate uh, based on where you are or where your loved one was murdered. Um, we just don't think that would be very fair to people. So, um, you know, and then, uh, Cheryl said, I'll never give up. That's the promise I made. And I think that that's, that's important, Cheryl. Obviously we know you very well and, uh, we know what you have gone through and, and, uh, we know that the struggles that you have faced and trying to get justice for your sister, um, Terrell is a, is a case that has been spotlighted uh, on our website, um, you know, in the past, uh, it's also one that we were able to get, um, you know, help facilitate with the, the local media uh, to get out there. Um, and, and, uh, and we were told that that, um, that, that media spot uh, that made it on TV, that it did generate some, some information. Um, it didn't end up generating an arrest and leading to an arrest, but, um, but it kind of highlights why it's so important to keep keep pushing the information out there because you never know who's going to see it and we can't control when they're going to see it. So if we shared Eugene Lanza's um, spotlight Monday, and if the person that needs to see it didn't see it, um, we don't know that. All we know is that, you know, uh, a few months down the road, a year down the road, when nothing else has happened, we've got to find another way to, to bring awareness for, for that case, you know? So, um, uh, because we don't just do this one and done. Here's your one um, one shot at getting some some uh, some publicity, you know, on social media, and then and then we move on. Uh, we have a, a constant list, and we're always looking at ways to help uh, raise awareness for these cases. So so keep that in mind, and um, you know. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to see responding. I just want to ask the why did I murder my only son? What was his reasons? You know, um, yeah. And and uh, Heather asked, you know, I would love to to be able to ask the killers why. And uh, you know, I think that's, you know, I think that's something that you know we all want to know why. Um, I just don't know that why is ever acceptable. You know what I mean? Because I think that. Um, you know, we, we want to know that information. We want to understand, uh, try to understand why they made that decision. Um, but they can't justify it. You know what I mean? And so you, you, um, you just, uh, it would be nice. I, and I know some families have gotten the opportunities to, to ask why, um, you know, and it's an important part of, I think, the healing process, if you can get that information. Uh, unfortunately, what we have seen a lot of times is that, you never find out why, because the defendant is so set on maintaining his innocence just in case they get out of prison, um, that they don't, that they never come clean on, uh, on being a part of it. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's another struggle that families face is even after an arrest and after a conviction that sometimes people will, um, you know, they still never get that answer. Why, you know, and, um, and so, and then some get that answer why, and it's, it's not, um, you know, um, it's not as comforting, you know, as they had hoped, particularly if a defendant tries to use a, um, you know, some kind of self-defense thing or something, you know, well, why did I do it? Because they were attacking me or something like that. And then that can be even, even more frustrating. So, um, but, you know, uh, Heather's mentioning again, like the, um, the ability to, to see them face to face. And I, I think that is important. And, you know, uh, anybody that's followed us for a little while knows the Freddie Farah case um, and, the, and that family. And, and um, you know, we've done Facebook Live. We've had uh, Freddie's son, Bobby, on and he did a fest Facebook Live with us. And, and basically the quick story is 43 years after Freddie Farah was murdered, uh, detectives made an arrest in the case. Um, less than, while the suspect was awaiting trial, he was in county jail for less than a year and the, the key witness died. 
um, and the state attorney's office was going to have to let them out and um, let him out. And when they um, when they talked to the family, you know, the family really wanted to have a meeting with the individual. Um, they were able to basically work out a deal where the guy pled guilty to second degree murder, um, admitted he was guilty because he did it in court um, and then met with the family and then was released um, from jail with time served, which was a little under a year in county jail. And um, and part of what that was, uh, that meeting, you know, was very helpful and therapeutic for uh, some family members and, and some family members, you know, were still pretty frustrated afterwards. But um, there was something about uh, being able to sit there and and he he did say why and he did uh, tell the story about what happened that day. And um, and, you know, Bobby in particular really um, did kind of take comfort in having that information. That was what he had wanted uh, since he was six years old when his dad was murdered was who and why. And, uh, and he got those things. And so the defendant uh, served less than a year in jail and is out um, and is, you know, back in New Orleans, work as a street performer. Uh, but but Bobby, at least, you know, um, has has some peace and comfort in getting the answers that he wanted. So, um, you know, so that that is important stuff. Um, so let's see. Um, Yeah. And, you know, talking about losing hope, I mean, you know, I always tell people there's there's a very fine line between hope and false hope. And we don't ever want to provide false hope that just by, you know, submitting your loved one's case to us, just by us, you know, raising awareness and publicizing it, that it's somehow going to be the, the the magical answer. We, we, we don't have those answers, um, but we know that we're doing something. We know that we're doing something that can possibly help. And potentially help and um and we want people to have uh faith and hope that um that, that their loved one one is not forgotten and two that there are still people out there seeking justice uh, and wanting to hold uh, those responsible accountable for their actions um, so and Kind of with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up because I haven't seen any questions in a, in a couple of minutes. And, um, uh, but, and I don't know if you guys can hear, but my kids are screaming like crazy downstairs and, uh, and it's kind of hard for me to, to concentrate and focus. So, um, so I'm, we've been going for over an hour, which is a little longer than I had intended to go today. So, um, but thank you all so much, um, you know, uh, for, for joining us, for chiming in, for posting, for interacting, for commenting, for asking questions, for allowing me the, the, the stage to explain uh, what I have learned over the last uh, 10 plus years now since my dad was murdered um, and, and, and how, you know, I see ways to, to assist and help. Um, you know, you are all uh, more than welcome for everything that our office provides. Uh, Frida, Clint, and I will, we you have no idea, I promise you, uh, how many uh, after hours, calls, texts, ideas, emails that, that our staff uh, has and that we are always, always thinking of your loved ones and in, in different ways that we can um, that we can share their story and uh, promote awareness for their case and try to get justice for each and every one of you. So um, so I we definitely appreciate that you guys recognize that and that you uh, are supportive of that. And uh, we will continue to do that. That's our our commitment to you and our promise to all of you is that we will we will keep doing that until someone forces us to stop. And I don't I don't see that happening. So thank you again all for joining us tonight. Uh, visit projectcoldcase.org to see our website, which is much different than our Facebook page, provides a lot of uh, details and information. Uh, Submit your loved one's case to us. Uh, the link is in the comments of this thread, and it's also on our website. And um, and join us again uh, next week, uh, where hopefully I'll have a guest on, maybe somebody to to help me uh, help me out and to provide some little a little more information from a little different uh, perspective. So um, thanks again. Really appreciate you guys. Um, uh, 
if you want to be a part of our support meeting on Thursday evening, make sure you reach out to our office, 904-525-8080 or Frida WP at projectcoldcase.org. And, uh, and we will help you. Um, so thank you all for joining me tonight. We will be in touch very soon.